it jumps around from executive teams to executive teams helping uh, companies thrive, which is awesome. He uses that as inspiration for creating really interesting books that are pseudo fiction, non fiction, telling real life, well, seemingly real life tangible stories about people and their struggle to survive as entrepreneurs. Uh, his latest book is From Nothing, which is actually on sale with Romans. Actually, give a shout out to Romans right now. Supporting local businesses and entrepreneurship, it's awesome. Uh, also, his books are on sale, and after, after the um, presentation and meetup, if you want to get it signed, he will also give you a free gift card, $10 off of Thrift Books, which is also something that he is on the board of directors for, the chair of Thrift Books and also the Goodman Company. So there's just so many things that he's working on. Give it up for Ken Goldstein. Have fun. Are we live? Thanks. I feel like I'm on evening at the improv. <laughs> Do you know this guy used to be shy? <laughs> we, we, used to, uh, we used to move hosts around, and he just kind of, I don't know. How did you like get this as a permanent gig? Like we call your agent or something? Uh, anyway, he, I, I, got, I got lucky. Um, Mike Schaefer couldn't make it, and then Tyrone couldn't make it, and it was just, it fell on me, and... I mean, I don't know if I nailed it, but oh, you're great. I'm still here. I'm you're still great. Here. <laughs> so um, Mike's the permanent host. I'm actually the Alec Baldwin of uh, Innovate Pasadena. This is my fifth time hosting SNL. I mean, Innovate Pasadena. Um, and uh, the Steve Martin of Innovate Pasadena is Andy Wilson, who actually created it. So he has a much better reason for being up here all the time than I do. Um, but I'm here today um, to talk a little bit about my new book and, uh, and some other things that might be on my mind. I, I can't say, and I say this every time, I'm going to be reading at Romans next month, um, I think July 12th. So if anybody, if you enjoyed tonight's talk uh, and you want to come back, come to that and tell your friends. Um, some of you also who know me know I'm just slightly um, a, a Dodger fan and a little bit in love with baseball. Um, everybody has their home stadium and every author has their home stadium. And for me, Romans is my home stadium. There is nothing that I love more than independent bookstores, even though I compete with them with my used book company, uh, thriftbooks.com. Uh, you write that down, thriftbooks. <laughs> Much easier to spell than Romans, but we don't have a place to go and hang out, and they have a place to go and hang out, and you've got to support your local bookstores. And so even though they do sell at regular retail price, which keeps the bookstore there, I will supplement that today for anybody who wants to come up and get a signature afterwards with a $10 gift card. Um, that you can use through books, no questions asked. So um, today is going to be a little different. Um, you probably notice I don't have any slides. Um, I promise you I've run more slides than all of you together ever <laughs> put together in more presentations. And if you ever want to see me run slides, great. I'll, I'll uh, invite you to do that, but we're not going to do that today because today is just me and you and um, a book. This one's uh, marked up. If you have some time, I'll read a little bit to you. Um, I want to tell you a little bit um, about my journey, how I got here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I write, and then a little more about why I wrote this book. And then if we have a little bit of time, I'll read to you and then take some questions about anything embarrassing that you want to ask me, given that the videotape is running and it'll be inescapable for me uh, to try to duck that. Um, so let's talk about something interesting. Let's talk about me. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the title of my um, career is an old Yiddish proverb. Um, lucky for you, I don't speak Yiddish, um, so I'll say it in English. Um, the title of my career is Man Plans and God Laughs. Um, and you'll see why. So unlike many of the recent speakers up here, I have to tell you that I did not drop out of college. Um, and I actually liked school. I liked it a lot. Um, I liked it so much that I got two useless majors. Um, I got a major in theater and a major in philosophy, and I had to pay them back for that. Um, and I came out here like everybody else after graduation, thinking that I would be a TV and film uh, writer. And you can see that I had been, made my first big mistake before the wheels ever hit the runway, coming out to LA to try to compete in that arena. Um, but getting out here in the, actually the year of the Olympics, 84, uh, I actually was able, after a couple of years, to break through. And I did, uh, wrote half a dozen screenplays, uh, optioned a couple, 
I worked uh, as a development executive for the executive producer of Hill Street Blues, who actually taught me how to write. Um, I worked on uh, a series with George Siegel called Murphy's Law. It was the correct title for that series. Um, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Um, I wrote a bunch of industrials and commercials. I actually, my claim, one of my claim famous, I wrote the first video for the first swimming pool aerobic workout. So you can see how glamorous the life of a writer can become. All that was going actually pretty well um, until the writer's strike hit in 1988. Anybody remember the writer's strike of 1988? Remember what happened in this town for a year? Whole town shut down. And if you were an emerging writer at the time, it didn't have a lot of cash reserves. Uh, it was a great time to run out of money, which I did very quickly. Um, but I kept myself busy. I continued to write and uh, found myself at a conference at UCLA called The Future of Television. Now, truth be told, the reason I went to that conference was because Stephen Bochco was the headline speaker, and Stephen Bochco had hired my boss, David Milch. And so getting to hear a little bit about the future of television from Stephen at the time he was an impresario was really quite attractive. I don't remember a single word of what he said. But there was another panel that day called Interactivity. And I wanted to know what that was. And luckily, no one on the panel knew what it was either. So it was something that I could dive right into. And it turned out what it meant was the very early days of adding stories to computer games. Now, you think about that at the time. How does this make any sense? Why does Pong need a story? And that wasn't the concept that we were looking for. What we were looking for was, could we actually bring emotion into games and storytelling into games? So I hooked up with some guys uh, at a company called Cinemaware. I called my union, and I said, does the Writers Guild have a point of view on writing for computer games? And the person on the phone said, what's a computer game? I said, we're good. <laughs> And so, uh, without violating my union contract, uh, I went off and wrote the first game that actually had a 100-page screenplay. It was a game called Wings. It was a World War I flight simulator. I see people nodding. I can't believe it. I know you remember Carmen Sandiego, but someone actually remembers Wings. The thing for Wings was, I actually proved I could make money not only as a writer, but as a writer in technology. And I said to the guys, look, I'll write games with you if you teach me how to code. Um, and they said, why do you want to learn how to code? You're a storyteller. I said, because you guys have all the power. And I need to understand what you do so that I can share that power with you. So they taught me a little bit about coding. And um, that led to a job at Philips Electronics on the first optical platform. That's on a shiny disc that kind of looks like a CD. DVD hadn't been invented yet. That's how far back in time we were. This was called CDI Compact Disc Interactive. Anybody remember that platform? Ah, there are some people old as me here. Um, and I designed a game called Zombie Dinos from Planet Zeltoid. <laughs> and it was good. And it was good enough to attract the people at Broderbund, which was a company up in Marin that was doing educational software games, to call me up and say, Ken, we played Zombie Dinos. It's a lot like Carmen Sandiego, except with dinos. They said, if you want to do Carmen San Diego, why don't you come here? And I said, hmm, that sounds like an opportunity knocking on my door. And shifted my career from LA to Marin County, where I had the, possibly the greatest run of both um, fun and money um, and great community and people. And for those of you who remember that company, we did games like Carmen, Mist. Um, li uh, living Books, if you remember uh, Living Books, Prince of Persia was one of my, it was actually written by one of my college uh, friends. Um, and the software industry was just exploding. And this company was exploding. And uh, to, to, to put it in perspective how important a company this was, for a very brief time in history, Broderbund Software was the second largest computer software comp consumer software company in the world behind a slightly larger company in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> now, luckily, I kept my stock in the company in the Pacific Northwest and still hold it to this day. Um, but we had a very, very good run, and we literally were the largest seller of CD-ROMs in the world. Everybody else in the world 
was considering a hit 100,000 copies. We didn't have one title that didn't sell a million copies. I know that doesn't sound like a lot today, but we had the first million unit seller. We had the first 10 million unit seller. We were the first company to ever spend a million dollars on a computer game. We were the first company to ever spend $10 million on a computer game. Now, every game that comes out on the PlayStation, the Xbox is 30 or $40 million, but the audience at that time was so small, you couldn't do something like that. So we had a very, very successful company until people said, huh, internet don't need a cardboard box with a shiny disc in it anymore. And that was pretty much the end of that company. We sold it. Kind of a bit of a scandal, and there might be some metaphors in the new book that go to that. But at that point, I had made friends with people at Disney. They had asked me if I wanted to come there, because at this point, I had become the family software guy uh, as, a, as a result of Carmen. And Disney said, huh, we need to have a presence on the internet. Can you come down and figure out how to bring the Disney brand to the internet? So my wife and I, we moved back. We came back to LA, and I thought it was just going to be a swell time. Didn't realize I had joined a multinational company with battling business units that was trying to break into the internet, um, and uh, all of that was going to be a whole lot of fun. Well, that wasn't enough. Do I remember, anyone remember what happened around 2000, 2001? Y2K. Oh, yeah. Y2K was good. Yeah. Y2K, everybody thought was going to be the problem. The problem was called the dot-com bubble and it burst, and we had a tracking stock out in the market, and uh, we had to roll that back in, and we had to put Disney back on its feet on the internet. It went through that bit of, uh, of joy. But we did launch a game called Toontown, and if you remember Toontown, Toontown, there we go, I love it when the head's not. Um, Toontown was the first massively multiplayer game for kids and families. We wanted to take games like World of Warcraft and make them safe for children to play, and Toontown was, uh, was, a, was a quite a nice hit. So that was actually a nice little run at Disney. And then my mentor, Michael Eisner, um, decided it was time for him to retire, and I had a very good relationship there, but decided if he was gonna retire, I needed to go do something else, and uh, went out and uh, met some venture guys and did a company called Shop.com, uh, which was in Monterey, and we were the first shopping comparison marketplace with an integrated single card solution. Um, if you do a little bit of study about that company, you'll find out that it was actually backed by Amazon. The reason it was backed by Amazon is they wanted something called a marketplace. We had got the original patent for that, and so we not only found ourselves with Amazon on our board, we find ourselves competing with Amazon um, for who was going to have the bigger marketplace, and you probably know who won. <laughs> um, so all of that was great, and uh, that company, we took it through the recession, and we sold it, and I found myself just on the edge of 50, yes, just on the edge of 50, and uh, was talking to my lovely wife about what I was going to do next, and she said, what happened to the guy who did zombie dinos from Planet Zeltoid? Where did he go? And she, I said, what do you mean? She said, the writer. What happened to the writer? And I said, well, he's like a CEO guy now. He gets to like run companies and yell at people. It's not lonely, it's fun. She's like, but is that what you really want to do? It's like, damn, this is going to be hard. So I decided I was going to go back and reinvent myself again as a writer, just about the age of 50. And there's an old saying uh, in, in Hollywood, if you want to send a message, call Western Union. You probably don't remember what Western Union is, but that used to be a thing they said to Hollywood writers, right? And I didn't believe that. I wanted to write about something. I wanted to write about things that matter. So I started to think to myself, why do we do difficult things? Why do we do difficult things? Not ordinary things like schlepping yourself here every week. Why do we do big things? Why do we pick a career? Why do we marry someone? Why do we divorce someone? Why do we start a company? Why do we write a book without an advance check? Who's done something difficult? Who's done something difficult? What's something difficult that you've done? Do you hear all that? Gave up a career as an investment banker to be a screenwriter. Why'd you do that? Because investment banking was soulless. Because investment banking was soulless. 
Who else has done something difficult? Who else has done something difficult? What have you done that's difficult? Sold your house. Sold my house, packed up and moved to LA from Massachusetts. Sold his house, packed up from LA, packed up his house in Massachusetts, moved to LA. Why'd you do that? Pardon me? For a new job. For a new job. Yeah. Anybody else who's done something difficult? Yeah, what'd you do? He bootstrapped the development of nutrition app, for three years. nutrition app for three years. Why'd you do that? Because I couldn't trust other people to get the job done. Because you couldn't trust other people to get the job done. I'm going to summarize my point of view on this, on why people do different things, and I'm going to have you repeat it back to me. Sound like a plan? Why do we do difficult things? Because we can't not. Try that again. Why do we do difficult things? That's all right. <laughs> Why do we do difficult things? Because we can't not. Because we can't not. So becoming a writer and writing about difficult things because we can't not. This is what I sat and thought about as I was writing my first book over there, This is Rage. It didn't matter to me if I made a fortune. It didn't matter to me if I made less than minimum wage. You know, most of the money I've made, and I've done OK, was when I wasn't thinking about the money at all. And the times that I was thinking about just the money, I didn't make any. Or I made so little that it didn't make any difference. Why do people do difficult things? Because we can't not. So this, to me, applies to business. It applies to art. It's all the same. You know, for people who just pursue the money, who just look at the money. I have found whenever I'm with someone like that, I'm usually with a pretty unhappy person. How happy were you in investment banking? Happy. Not happy. Because it wasn't what you couldn't not do. It was a different target. So when things get unbalanced, when it becomes too much about the outcome and not enough about the process, I say the wheels come off the wagon. And that's what happens to the lead character in my new book. In fact, the entire world for this person falls apart. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I don't like money. I'm a capitalist. I believe in our system. I believe in starting companies. I believe the company should always make a profit. I just know for me, when I knew that I had enough, and when I knew that I had enough, and I knew that my life was more than half over, I knew I had to do some other things. And why did I decide to do the difficult things? Because we can't not. And that's what I went after. So I'm going to ask all of you, as I'm talking a little bit about the book today, From Nothing, to think about what you're doing right now and what you should be doing. And the reason you should be doing it, because you can't not. So let's think about this book a little bit and think about the tagline. The tagline is a novel of technology, bar music, and redemption. What a strange group of things to write a book about. But let's start with technology. Why did I write yet another book about technology? Well, for me, technology is a catch-all for innovation. And innovation is a catch-all for creativity. So let's dwell for just a second on this idea of creativity. Creativity is that potent elixir. It's that explosive, disrupting brew that's common across all of these life-changing endeavors, all of these things that we do because we can't not. There's creativity in starting a company. There's creativity in writing a book. And there's creativity in reinventing your life. That's a subject that I always want to talk about. And it's a particularly painful subject because real creativity the kind of creativity that leads to change, that leads to innovation, is not easy. It's not the same. We think of creativity as, oh, let's go to kindergarten and do finger painting, right? That's a kind of creativity. There's only one thing we learn with finger painting, which is you got to make a mess. Because if you don't make a mess, you're not pushing yourself hard enough. You're not letting things happen. That's what creativity is. It's going there. It takes creativity to galvanize a team. It takes creativity to throw out the old ideas and then reinvent yourself with a new winning concept. It takes creativity to stand up to adversity. 
So this is a story about creativity, but more important than creativity, it's a story about courage because behind the power to push creativity is the courage that you need to go forward with it. It takes courage to pursue a dream. It takes courage to have faith in yourself, particularly when everyone around you thinks that you're a little bit nuts. Now, you remember the Steve Jobs campaign, Think Different? How did that, how did that TV commercial begin? What did it start with? What was he toasting at the beginning of that commercial? What did he say? Here's to the... Say it? Here's to the... Dreamers, here's to the... Who said it? I heard crazy ones. Who, here's to the crazy ones, right? Here's to the crazy drums, ways, crazy ones, the ones who want to change things. Steve Jobs would say there's also one other piece. Hard work, immense hard work, immense dedication, immense commitment. Some people today call that grit. So you take creativity, you take courage, you take grit. And what else do you need? What else do you need? Luck. You got to get a lucky break. I see heads nodding, right? How many of us take our creativity and take our courage and take our grit, our grit and hang in there long enough to wait for that lucky break? Everybody has to get a bit of luck. If you think you're doing it all yourself, you're not paying attention. The thing about luck is, do you know what to do when it comes to you? Are you ready to respond to that luck based on everything that's come before? Some people are, some people aren't. So as you think about that thing that you wanna do because you can't not, are you applying the creativity? Are you applying the courage? Are you applying the grit? And are you waiting to see that bit of luck when it comes your way? That's how we make innovation happen. That's how technology changes the world. So that was the first bit of, of uh, subject matter I wanted to take on in the story. Second bit is bar music. Why bar music? Well, I think we all have a soundtrack to our lives. I think we all have songs in our head that we apply to different things. Who has a song in their head right now? Who's got a song running? Yes, what song do you have in your head? Some... Okay, you can go home. <laughs> you ruined my talk. Thank you very much. Who's got a song in their head right now? Who's got a song that's ringing in there? Yes, sir. Under pressure. Under pressure. Why is that song in your head right now? What do you associate with that song? Um, because, you brought up, yeah, the soundtrack. because of the soundtrack. It's on a soundtrack? Up, yeah. Okay. Soundtrack. So do you associate that with good things or bad things? A little bit of both, okay. So that's running through your head. Who else got a song in their head? Who had a song in their head this morning when they were in the shower? Who had a song in their, car, in their head in their car? Yes, sir, what song? Uh, it's my own song. It's your own song. <laughs> this man writes the own soundtrack of his lives. There he is. <laughs> that's very good. Uh, tell me the name of your song. It's called Delight. Delight, okay. Why is that song in your head? Delight in me sees delight in you. Is that the light or delight? It's a TH. Okay, the light. Okay, great. Thank you. Who else has a song in their head? Who else has a song? Over here. Yes, what song? Frankie Valli's Oh, What a Night. Oh, What a Night. Frankie Valli, All a Night. Pardon me? Two days running now. Two days. Can't get it out of your head. You want to you confess to a few of your closest friends why that song stuck in your... It's okay, Frankie Valli. We're not judgmental. What's that? You got to listen to it. You have no idea. yesterday. Yeah. So I think we all have a soundtrack to our lives. And I think these songs mostly cement in our brain before the age of 20 and then stay with us for the rest of our lives. And those songs constitute the backgrounds to what we're thinking. So when I hear any song by Paul McCartney, it reminds me of my wife. And I like those songs, even when she's mad at me. Because they remind me she won't always be mad at me. Right? <laughs> Good, because I was going to have to go home and destroy my entire Paul McCartney collection. <laughs> so another song um, that is in the book is a song that I really loved for a very long time. 
And unfortunately, that song was playing the day that my favorite company that I worked for was shut down. And it was playing in the car as I was leaving that place for the last time. And so for many, many years after that, that song made me sad, even though I loved it, because I associated it with that event. And now I love that song again, because I've put that behind me, and I've put that song to work in this book, and now that song is again part of the soundtrack of our lives. So when I was a kid, back in the 1960s, most of us wanted to either be an astronaut or a rock star. Now, I wanted to be a writer, but like that Steve Jobs thing, I was one of the crazy ones. But when we grew up, they had these electronic karaoke bars we could go to. So suddenly, everyone could be a rock star. And when you go into these clubs now and you see people, what are they singing? Beyonce. They're singing, the new, young people are singing Beyonce. The old people like me are singing the classic rock songs because those are the soundtrack of our lives. So I took that concept of karaoke in this book and I took it a little farther to put it on stage because what if we took that love of the music that's inside of us and exposed it to a public audience? What kind of a fantasy would that be? Where would that take us? What if we exposed the soundtrack of our lives to a larger audience? So that was another concept I wanted to apply because being an astronaut was much harder. But now Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Richard Branson are making it easy, so we all can be astronauts. So where's Mike Schaefer? <laughs> Mike, that cartoon of you up there, on the, that can actually happen now. So you don't have to go on stage for karaoke. You can be... Uh, there you go, and cats and pizza. <laughs> so the last piece of this puzzle is redemption, the process of healing, the necessity of spiritual rebirth. Now you say, now he's going into some real, like, really weird spaces, like, okay, we're okay with the creativity thing, we're okay with like, the, 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 the soundtrack thing, but spiritual rebirth, really, like we gotta go there. So if you know me, and some of you do, you know that I'm obsessed with philosophy. It's, I've been all my life since, since I'm a kid. And if you read my books, I will drip this philosophy into your veins one little drop at a time. You won't even know it's coming. It's the spoonful of sugar that makes the medicine go down. See, I learned something at Disney. So I'm not a particularly religious person. But I will tell you if you study philosophy from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, there's very little distinction between philosophy and theology. It's pretty much the same thing in the Western canon. So you learn about the study of redemption. You're all going, oh great, now we're gonna get a lecture on the humanities. I thought we were gonna talk about Elvis. <laughs> well, you're gonna do a little bit of Elvis, a little bit of Beatles, and a little bit of epistemology. When I think about redemption, what I think about is starting over, which is both the process of letting go and the process of facing the blank page. It's the same for literature as it is for running a company. You have to have the freedom to begin anew. You begin eternally. Everything you do, you begin from nothing. That's how we get out of being stuck with who we were. That's how we can be who we want to be, by bringing the process of redemption into play, we let go of both the traps of our success and the debilitation of our failures. All of that is in the past when you're starting from nothing. And it's the hardest thing in the world to do because you have to let go of everything that made you who you are to become who you want to be. Why do we do difficult things? Because we can't not. Why do we do difficult things? Because we can't not. My lead character, Victor Salo, does difficult things. He has a lot of very bad days. But what he does, he does because he can't not. He begins from nothing. He has no home. He has no family. He has no foundation. And he winds up running a company and he winds up losing the gig running a company and has to start over from nothing. 
Now, I could have ended the novel there, but it would have been really short, and Gil wouldn't have had anything to sell. So we had to take it a little farther. We had to take Victor into a situ situation where he becomes open to the accidents that bless his life. I want to say that again because that sounds a little weird. He has to be open to the accidents that bless his life. The accidents that befall him are blessings because every time Victor is knocked down, he has a new chance at redemption. He has a new chance to begin from nothing. Victor is struggling between freedom and determinism, between the idea of his human independence and faith that the decisions have already been made for him. Those are the decisions that he has to reconcile. Think about that. What does that mean to your life? If you're going to attempt something difficult, why do we do difficult things? Because we can't not. You're going to have to open yourself to the blessing of redemption. You're going to have to open yourself to the risk of discovery. That's the challenge that Victor has to face. And it's the same challenge that we all face in all of those difficult things that we choose to do. This is just the path that he chooses to go down to find his redemption. So let me try, this, tie, try to tie all this together for you, a lot of heady stuff, and I've still got a minute or two, I'll read you a quick passage from the book and answer some questions. So let's synthesize, let's bring this all together. All of the compartments of our lives are connected. When you call on creativity, when you choose to innovate, you are attempting the impossible. You are trying to break through where somebody hasn't broke through before. What you are doing does not exist. Therefore, you're choosing to do something that nobody knows is real or not real. That's where your courage kicks in. The word, rewards that you're looking for will come or they won't come. The process is what drives you, not the end game. Chase the end game and you will crap out. Chase the process. Because just when you think you are out of the woods and everything is going well, here's one thing I will promise you, and I experienced it in the last four hours. You're going to get slapped down. Something is going to happen out there that you didn't plan. Oh, the heads are nodding, right? And you're going to take a shot. And the question is, how many of those times are you going to get slapped? How many times are you going to get whacked? And are you going to continue to hang in there? Because you need that taste of luck. And you're going to face these choices with or without the luck. So the question is, are you paying attention to everything that came before? No life challenge that you face is ever over if you're willing to start over. And you have to be willing to start from nothing. Your creativity is finished when you're repeating what you did before. If you go back and do more of the same, I talk about in Endless Encores, you become a one-hit wonder. You don't want to be the one-hit wonder. You want to be the person who puts that thing behind them and starts over from nothing. Starting over is how we become who we are. Being willing to start over at every stage of your life is how we stay who we are. And what's really important about all of that is that we need to remember to sing. We need to live the soundtrack of our lives. Music, that soundtrack of our lives, those songs that are inside of us, those songs are what carry us through. Those songs are our path to redemption. Those songs will cause us to heal. We have to listen to the soundtrack of our lives and we have to respond to it. Why do we do difficult things? Why do we do difficult things? Thank you. I'm gonna read one passage. Oh, please do, please do. Just because I have to, because Gil will say, great, what was all that philosophic stuff about? I gotta sell the book. <laughs> and don't forget, I got a $10 gift card if you come up and ask me to sign it. All right, so, um, this is just a short passage um, from the, the book really is built around this conceit of a concept album. How many people remember Dark Side of the Moon? Ah, so tell me the story in that. I can tell you the story in this. 
When the company hit a run rate of $150 million in sales and $17 million in net income, Thrice Baked Ventures took the company public at a $1 billion valuation. Bud was a superstar again. Victor had his retirement in the bank if he wanted it. All was lush within the pastoral hills of Marin. That was six years ago, a colossal achievement. Over the next year, the stock price quadrupled. That made it a gusher. It was harvest time. The board cashed in. New marching orders filtered without melody through the Art Deco corridors. Milk the cow, never feed her. Milk the cow, never feed her. Victor had a broad, encompassing plan of where to expand next. They would build out a predictive database. They would data mine the patterns of uploads and rent the trends to producers and distributors. All the data they ever needed for a 360-degree vision of popular music economics was stored on their servers. They simply needed to reinvest a small amount of their profits in documenting the framework and expanding their sales force. Ah, it shan't be so, resolved the board's board of directors. We're in late stage. The street loves our profits, but we have to scale into our mammoth multiple. A higher growth rate and new development projects are risky. It's easier to slim down costs, optimize our EBITDA, generate improved operating income, pump out cash. The myopic board mandated a unified and consistent, consistent strategy, manufacture more of the same, all at a higher contribution mar margin, lock the platform, let the world's musicians come to us, we're the only game in town, and a good one. Victor was instructed to enger, engineer flow through, revenue dollars that drop straight to the bottom line, and while he was at it, keep as few engineers as possible on the payroll. Lower the overhead, lower R&D expense, scale into higher returns on reduced income. Grow the base, ride the horse in the direction it's going, tread water safely in the shallow end of the pool. The quarterly earnings statements would be gorgeous, exquisite works of art. Nothing would please them more. Creativity and innovation could best be expressed in a shining income statement and a balance sheet, all legal, impenetrable, absent waste and access, a one-dimensional cash flow wonder. They already had a great product that was proven. Extracting value responsibly was what mattered. Harvesting at this time in the company's life cycle was the will of Wall Street. The board would hear no argument to the contrary. They were wise. They had been there before. They knew their stuff. Damn it all, they knew their stuff. Hear the chant. Sing it in your sleep. Milk the cow. Never feed her. Milk the cow. Never feed her. That's the challenge that Victor begins the book with, the fall of his company. I'd love to read the entire book to you. <laughs> but then and our friends from Romans would have nothing to sell. But I would like to take any questions about creativity, writing, or any of those other things. And I thank you very much for your time. This Ken Amen. Goldstein, that was amazing. Uh, that, I, I really enjoy um, just the candid talk about uh, the evolution of yourself and how ultimately two useless degrees in college actually panned out to an amazing writing career. Uh, and tying all that creativity into real life experiences that you've had as a CEO of multiple companies, uh, the successes and failures that you've seen, and turning that into tangible stories with your character is really remarkable. Uh, it's a great book. I highly recommend that you guys check it out. And again, if you want to support local business, Romans is right here. Yeah, so vote with your dollars. Um, in any case, we're going to open it up to Q&A. If you have questions, John will walk around with the mic. We'll get them answered. We're going to save comments and storytelling for offline. Ken will be, will, will be hanging out with us anyway for book signing. So if you'd like to share stories about books that you've written or whatever, please save it for then. Thanks. Got to go all the way to the other side of the room, but uh, while I'm walking. What, what's the name of that song that you mentioned earlier? Like that, that keeps, <laughs> I keep wondering about that. Yeah, I would, I would ruin the first chapter for you if I told you. <laughs> Well, actually, I'm glad John asked because I don't need the name of the song, but my curiosity was you associated that song with something really sad, and then you said you got back to happy afterwards, and I'm curious if that's because you processed the grief over that moment and that loss, or if you hit a moment where you realized that company shutting down was the best thing that ever happened to you, and then you associate that song with that greatest moment for you. Wow, there's about 25 questions in there. Uh, I have not gotten over that company shutting down because I've spent the rest of my life trying to find an experience as great. But knowing that it's not going to come back, I'm open to start from nothing at what it means. 
Um, I'm not good at processing grief. I'm better at letting go and starting over again. Um, grieving is hard. Um, and, and I haven't found exactly the right way to apply it to creativity. What I found is that being obsessed with something that isn't gonna come back is a freezing point. So it's easier for me to release it at a certain point and then start over. Um, with that particular song, it was just, it just happened to be playing at the wrong time as I was literally driving out of that parking lot for the last time. And I'm like, great, that's gonna ruin it. And until I was able to put it into this book in a context where I was giving birth to something again, that's when I was able to start loving it again. Um, but uh, other people are better at, at the idea of processing it. Um, I just have to release it and let it go and go on to something else. Um, but um, I'm open to, uh, to the exploration uh, on, on something else. I would love to find a moment as great um, as that Carmen San Diego. Not that the events aren't great. I love thrift books. I love Disney. I love working with Lisa. Uh, I work a little bit with Mike Schaefer, and I love all of that. Um, but there was just a, a moment of capture there that was very, very powerful. Um, and uh, it was just that perfect combination of doing good work, being financially rewarded for it, and being uh, surrounded by some of the most wonderful uh, creative people of all time, many of whom now you know, sort of hang out on my website and, and you know, will read some of that in this story. But uh, I'd love to find that again. And I guess I, I know what Camelot is, but the one thing I also know about Camelot is it will fall. Camelot will not last. I could get political about that, but I won't. <laughs> uh, what are your writing habits, if any? It's funny. I just, I just published a, a, a review that I did. Everybody asks that question. I am like the worst. I mean, nobody is worse than I am. I have tried every everything in the world to say it's this two hours out of the day, it's this block, whatever. I even, I'm like, like so ridiculously compulsive, I, I do block it every day on my calendar, and then I move it, uh, <laughs> and, and then I move it again, and then I delete it and start another block. Um, I, it goes back to that sort of semi-spiritual thing. Again, I don't know that my wife is 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 much more um, eloquent on the point, um, and believes that we are channels for other for other intervention. Um, I know that when it comes to me, it comes to me, and I just got to go with it. And if that means I'm going to go all night, I'm going to go all night. Um, that can be really really problematic when you have a 7 a.m. meeting the next morning. Um, but when it's coming, it's coming, and I go with it. I wish that I could block it out and be more disciplined about it, but. The thing that I fear as a writer, I think a lot of writers fear, um, when you know that that voice will come to you and it will come through you and the words will come out of you, um, and then you go through a block where it doesn't come, like I freak out. Like you go, where's that voice that's supposed to be speaking to me? And if it goes like a week or 10 days or you know 30 days, and you go, okay, that's it, it died, the voice went away, There's no, it's not gonna speak to me again. And then usually it will be something like a song or I'll be talking to one of you and you'll say something inspirational. I'll go, oh my goodness, that's it. And then boom, right back at it. But if I could be more disciplined about it, I could knock out, like these guys who can knock out a book a year, I don't know how they do it. Um, but if I could be more disciplined, I would. But I go with it when it comes. And then the one thing I've taught myself is when it comes, it doesn't matter. Um, just go with it. If it's two hours, if it's four hours, if it's six hours, you know, just go with it and let it come because you don't know when it's gonna go away or I don't know when it's gonna go away. And that can be problematic because sometimes you'll get a call from me saying I'm canceling lunch. Um, and if I call you up and say I'm canceling lunch because I'm writing, you either know me or you'll never speak to me again. So <laughs> that's that. All right, that's all the time we have for Q&A. Here's one more right here. Oh, there's, uh, yeah, you're going. I, I just was curious, you've made a lot of changes in your career. Yeah. Yeah. How have you made that decision to, to make those changes? Can um, we repeat the question for the audience? Yeah, the question is some changes were foisted upon me, some I made from the blank page. Just, just um, I will advise all of you to have a very small circle of friends 
who are enormously trusted. If you're gifted like I am and have a wife that will listen to you blather on um, sort of you know, incoherently, that's, that's helpful, but their spouse can only be abused so much. Uh, you need to have spiritually abused. Uh, you need to have a circle of, of confidants who you can say, I have this really weird idea um, I don't know if it makes any sense, and I hope you won't hate me if I tell you. And if you can go to three or four people and get 75% of them to tell you that you're not nuts, you probably got a shot at it. But I have a group of people who I trust who are very smart, usually very diverse, diverse in income. Don't just ask rich people like the answers to your questions, and don't just ask poor people the answers to your questions. Don't just ask boys, and don't just ask girls. Don't just ask college ed educated, and you got to get a, a good sample. And the most important thing about, I'll, give, I'll, I'll be as honest as the day is long, okay, and, she, and my wife will verify it. Broderbine offered me the job running the studio. What did I say to him? What did I say when they called? I said no, right? Um, and I said no for the dumbest reason, right? I said no for the dumbest reason, because I didn't want to move. Right? And, and well, again, having an understanding wife is a very big deal because a lot of people's spouses don't want to move. Um, and she was just like, are you nuts? Like, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. You got to do this. And um, I was like, yeah, I know, but you know, we're here and we like it here and this and that. And um, I listened. If you're going to ask somebody for feedback, <laughs> for the love of God, listen because otherwise you're just blowing smoke and people will say they ask for feedback all the time and then they do what they were going to do anyway because they're an independent thinker, ha ha. That's actually, a, there's a term called ask hole. I, I think that is very yeah. appropriate. <laughs> and it's funny because I've had people in this room come up to me and they say, can I run something by you, blah, 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 and I'll give them some feedback and then I'll talk to them a year later and they'll go, yeah, yeah, no, I, I didn't do that, which is fine, that's their choice. Um, but have that circle of people that you can get outside of yourself and then ask each of them independently for some feedback, people that you trust, and then listen. Because if three or four of them are telling you something is probably not a bad idea, and if they're t all telling you it's like a really bad idea, but then at the end of the day, you have to own the decision. And let me tell you, I only told you about successes up here. I could give a whole nother lecture on stuff that crapped out. I got games out there that were so bad that, you know, I, I had salespeople come back and say, I didn't know that numbers could be that low, <laughs> right? So that's out there. And, and luckily, you know, you can put that stuff behind you. But you got to learn from your failures, your successes, and you got to have a trusted panel. Okay, I'll be here signing books. Please do support Bromans. I do have gift cards for you, and thank you very much. I will be back. We had a, we've got a reception tomorrow afternoon at Echo Factory. You're all welcome to come. Uh, we're bringing the wine. Uh, there's going to be some food. I'll be reading a couple of more passages if you're interested in the book. And then again at Romans next month. And thank you. I will be here for a little while. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you.